I guess what I'd like to, to say here at the beginning is um, I always, always feel a little bit humbled and um, I guess shy about showing you the uh, human brain because it is, of course, what represents who this particular person was. And um, let me take it out of this sort of ignomious vat of paraphernaldehyde here. Uh, I don't know the exact history of this brain, but I can tell you that uh, this is a brain that uh, probably suffered some damage along the way. Uh, we know that the brain contains all this individual's memories. We know this brain contains all this individual's uh, thoughts and emotions. It was uh, whenever this person first fell in love, it was somehow encoded in this brain. Whenever this person um, first uh, had, a, had a pet and decided he, could take, he or she could take care of it, it was encoded in this brain. And so the brain contains essentially what we are as humans. And this is why I always feel a little bit humbled as we're talking about this human brain, because it really did represent a person who lived a real life and uh, experienced all the things we do as humans. And uh, I mentioned a second ago, this individual uh, did have some problems. And I don't know the clinical history of this individual, except that I can tell by looking at the uh, sulci and gyri of the brain, which are the bumps and the grooves in this brain, that they are a little unusual. And let me point out to you, okay, first of all, that this is the anterior, the front part of the brain, and this is the posterior, the back part of the brain. And uh, so let's look at the back part of the brain for a second, the so-called occipital lobes. And in a second, I'll show you some slides, which has all this nicely color-coded and everything, so you can look at that. But if we look at the occipital lobes on this particular brain, you see that, yeah, there are grooves here, okay? but they're all very tightly bound together. You can't really see down inside these valleys, if you will, in the brain. However, up here in uh, the parietal lobes and even portions of the frontal lobes, you can see that there are deep valleys, or deep, deep sulci, as we refer to them. And so that's, that's abnormal, that's pathology. And uh, so this individual had some neurodegenerative disease. The neurons were dying. It may have been Alzheimer's disease, it may have been some other neurogenerative disease, uh, Huntington's, Korea, or something like that. We don't, as I say, I don't have the clinical history, but we do know that this person was suffering from some disease. There's also a remnant of a kind of a hole here, which tells me the person may actually have had a tumor, and uh, the tumor was removed, perhaps, before uh, this individual died, or Perhaps it was dislodged whenever the brain was removed from the skull. And what you can also see here is uh, what looks like some filmy material that is over part of the brain, and other parts look more open so you can see. The, uh, this filmy material is part of the protective uh, membranes in the brain. This is uh, called the dura mater. For example, there are three protective membranes that we're going to talk about today. But the dura mater is, on your brains, is a lot more cushiony and soft than this. Uh, it's more like sort of styrofoam. But because this brain has been sitting in formaldehyde for a while, it's just kind of collapsed and it looks kind of like plastic wrap of some kind on here. Um, but normally that would be covering the entire brain and the the function of the dura mater and the pia mater in the arachnoid membrane, the three meninges, as we call them, is to cushion the brain from impact. So that if you're a football player and somebody hits you out on the football field and uh, your head whips back, uh, your brain also moves 
and what we don't want it is bumping up against the hard skull directly. Um, your brain is, um, let's talk about this, the feel of the brain. In a second here, I'm going to invite you to put on gloves and you can touch the brain. But uh, as I touch it, I guess I kind of liken it to feeling like clay. But your brain, my brain right now, sitting in our heads, does not feel like this. It's because it's uh, been in formaldehyde for a while that it feels kind of hard. Your brain and my brain is much more viscous and gooey. Um, if you ever had a really disgusting cold and you uh, sneezed into your handkerchief and look and see what that material looked like, uh, that's the essence of what brain looks and feels like. Yes, I'm telling you that the brain is kind of like snot-like material. It's kind of gooey and moves around. So it's very important that you have the meninges to kind of cushion, cushion the brain as it moves around in, in your skull, like as I was mentioning, on impact. Um, one thing that's obvious about the brain, by the way, you can see this thing hanging down. Anybody want to guess what that is? It's not meninges in this case. It's another important kinds of cells in the brain besides neurons and glia. What keeps your brain running, do you suppose? Cerebral spinal fluid is an important part of brain, it's not really the energy source of the brain. Artery? What? Is it an artery? It's an artery, yeah. It's a vein. I can't tell right now whether it's a vein or an artery, but it's, you know, this is, there's blood vessels, of course, that go throughout the brain, and this is a blood vessel that's kind of been dislodged. And, uh, put it back on top. I'm not sure that's where it goes either, honestly. Um, <laughs> Let's look underneath the brain for a second, and we'll notice also something odd here, but this was not part of this individual's pathology. Uh, the part that I'm holding of the brain, the part of the brain is called the cerebral hemispheres, but um, there's other parts or sections of the brain. For instance, this is the, this is the pons down here, this kind of bump in the anterior portion of the brain stem. And that feeds down to the medulla, sometimes referred to as the medulla obligata. But that feeds down to the medulla. And then this is, of course, the cutoff spinal cord, which normally would extend down this far. And um, very important part of the central nervous system, the spinal cord, very important in getting body senses up to your brain, uh, feelings of pressure and touch and heat and so on, pain. Uh, and also putting information down to your muscles to be able to control it, control your muscles. But the other part of the, the brain that you would normally see here and here, there's half of it that we've cut off and used for something else. And this is the cerebellum. And so normally you would see bilateral cerebellum here on, on both sides. Uh, the cerebellum being really important in posture and maintaining balance, things like that. It's, uh, you're getting tired of standing up here now. It's your cerebellum that's allowing you to maintain your balance so that you don't flop around and fall over. And um, so a uh, very important structure, one that has only recently gotten a lot of investigation. We used to think the cerebellum was mostly involved in automatic kinds of um, processes. We now know that, for instance, learning takes place in the cerebellum. That was not known up until about uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, if you were to be able to look down here, and some of you will be able to see this, there's two little bumps down here, kind of at the base of the brain. Uh, those are the mammillary bodies, and you can see a little hole here uh, which is one of the major arteries that's going into the brain and feeding into uh, all those other blood vessels in the brain. But right now, I'm just going to stop talking. But usually, as I'm talking about this, it raises questions on your part, like that you might want to ask about the brain. So let me just pause here for a second and see what questions you might have about this particular brain or 
about what you've seen so far? 